late night last night? Not really. Nah, we went out. We're just chilling at Shimmers. Shimmer. Nice. Beautiful spot. It's nice, right? It's a really yeah. nice spot. Yeah, so we're just chilling around there. But like, 2 a.m. is like the it. normal. And it's Dubai for you? Yeah. People will not start eating until 1 a.m. Do you know what I mean? So it's just like the norm. <laughs> yeah. So like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. is just like an early night. Well, listen, let's, let's, if we can, Anthony, let's start with what you were doing on Saturday. Because right behind you yeah. is the magnificent Burj Al Arab. The helipad has become synonymous with Correct. some of the biggest names in world sport. And you were up there. Talk to us about that experience. Uh, it's, it's, it was an experience for sure. Like I've been to the top of the Burj Khalifa, which was good. It's awesome. Unbelievable. But I think this was different because when I went there, it was nighttime. And this was daytime, so woken up early and the opportunity came about and it's something that you grab with both hands. As you said, it's an iconic spot in Dubai and some of the high-end athletes have like performed some of their tricks and skills on there. So it was my turn to do a little bit. Um, and boxing is interesting because it's such a grassroots sport. So it's like, it's grassroots, but then you're at the top of the, of the verge. Like, it's such a big contrast. So it was interesting of how am I going to make this look better than what it is? Because boxing, you have your gloves, a coach, and that's all you need. You know where I'm coming from? Yeah. So I was thinking, how are we going to make this look good? And um, the setup up there already is done for you. You just have to turn up. You know, so it was great. When I looked at the pictures, and I haven't seen the footage, but the pictures look phenomenal. The view looks great. And um, as you said, not everyone can go up there, so it feels like a, a special moment. Yeah, when you look at the names, Tiger Woods back in 2001, I think yeah. it was, Roger Federer played a tennis match with Andre Agassi up there. Yeah. When you think about those names, is it surreal to you that you are in that echelon of sportsmen where you're transcending your own sport? Yes, most definitely. And I've never looked at it that way. I've always just rolled with the punches, you know? Well, I try to. <laughs> I've tried to roll with the punches. And, um, but these things, these opportunities that happen, along with the names you said, start making you realize that, I want to say it's a game to be played, but I have an opportunity to create like a legacy. So I'm at the starting blocks, you know? So I've got a long way to go, but to be doing these type of things along with these names, is definitely something that can go down in the history books. As you said, not everyone gets to go up there and perform. So it does, um, it does make me realise that things are getting serious. And even though we've achieved certain things in, in boxing, as you said, when you start transcending outside of your sport, you start realising that this is, a whole different, this is a whole different avenue that we're about to go down. And are you going to use that profile to, to, to kind of change other people's lives? Is that the idea? Yeah, 100%. So it's interesting because it's, you've got the foundations, which is all about sport, and you have to be selfish. You have to be so self. Not about anyone else, it's about yourself, it's about your sport, and that's what my coach would tell me. So I then, I then took time out here, because I'm away from all the hustle and bustle of London, so I start reading again, because um, if I'm going to use this opportunity as a platform to be like a spokesman, a role model, and uh, use it as a chance to change people's lives, I have to know what direction I'm going in. So with like, it's like we're in an era of so much information, you don't even know what you want to change because there's so much information that, keep on, that keeps on coming in. So I just kind of slowed myself down, picked up some books, reboot my mind, clear my memory again and just start focusing. And then a focused mind is a driven one. And as long as I want to help change someone's life, I'll find the avenue I want to go down. But for sure, that's why I've started to like take time, stay off my phone, pick up a book and just reboot my mind again so I can start doing more positive things. You mentioned there, Anthony, that you have to be selfish, but that flies in the eye of what we know all about you. You are someone who is very humble, very down to earth, someone who has a, a committed and loyal set of, of friends, your family man as well. Mm. So how do you separate those two things and how easy does that come to you? I think everyone needs their time. Everyone needs a little bit of me time. And I understand that as well. So when it comes to the friends, it's good because they get it. So what, what relationship I have with them is just like we were just school friends. Nothing's changed there, so that's fine. When they want their time, they get it. When I want my time, I get it. Same thing with the family. I leave the, the work life at the door. And other than that, the relationship I have with my family and friends, the energy that I do save around there, I can give to other people. But if it was 
giving a lot of energy to the family, giving tons to my mates. I wouldn't have any energy to give elsewhere. So they kind of let me balance my lifestyle and they understand when I need to give energy, when I don't, and when I need some me time. Let's go back if we can to the start of your, your journey in boxing. Mm -hmm. We see with so many great champions, and it's become almost a cliche, they say, you know, boxing has saved my life. <laughs> would you agree that, or would you concur with that? Would it, did it save your life? At the time, I don't know where my life was going, but at the time, it definitely had a lot of benefits. And not the benefits of, I want to be a world champion, um, I want to be famous, I want to, you know, these type of things that come with a celebrity status. It wasn't none of that. This is a gladiatorial sport. And then I looked at what like the champions used to do and they used to read a lot. And I just, I feel as if boxing is so much more about like uh, discipline, regiment. It promotes a healthy lifestyle, which I wasn't living before I started boxing. Now I've changed. I understand about my health, health benefits. And these are the things that it changed my life for. And then people around me have an impact on it a positive impact so um, it definitely changes your life for the better I don't know where I would have been career wise but scrap career if you're not developed as a person it doesn't matter what opportunity you're given I don't think you're gonna reach your full potential so boxing helped me reach my potential as a person not just as a career if you know where I'm coming from mm -hmm. so career wise I put that aside but as a person it definitely changed my life so where was your mindset at and I'm taking Ooh. you back to the age I think 17 yeah. Anthony, but can you remember where your mind was before you took that decision to, to walk into a gym, to step into a boxing yeah. ring, and how that's changed? It's uh, what attracts you, you know, what type of things tempt you, what type of things, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's temptations, you know, it depends what music you like. Music I listen to kind of gets me buzzing and uh, <laughs> just just the temptations of life I think so where my mind was at the time was um, like that do or die mindset no fear um, I would rather be feared than respected but now I, I prefer respect it's real do you know where I'm coming from when I leave the room I'd rather people say that's a nice guy that than say oh, thank god he's gone what an idiot <laughs> when I walk in, they shit you. So you know where I come from. A few. <laughs> so I think um, respect, you know, is much better. And back in the day, it wasn't about respect. It was just more about fear. You, you're obviously being blessed with a physique and a, an athletic frame well. that we, we can only <laughs> dream of. Uh, we're glad we're sitting on the opposite side, but not next to you. But but uh, when you you know when you got into a boxing ring for the first time, you, you'd been a sprinter, you'd been a footballer. Yeah, 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 what was yeah. it about boxing that instilled that or drew, or drew out that discipline in you? And, and can you remember the first time you put on a pair of gloves and, and how it felt? I just remember like football. It's a fun game. <laughs> It's so fun, do you know what I mean? Like, it's interesting because I hear about retired players that still go out and play football, got nets in there. When I'm done with boxing, yeah. I don't want to see a boxing bag with again. With guts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see it's a fun game that you can do with your kids and your family. Um, same running, you know, I think that's more a career, it's individual. And I think boxing is a career, it's more of an individual sport. And it was just like, at the time, I always say like some men, when they have a baby, it's like, God, I need to change my life. I need to get a job. And boxing was like that baby I had, something I dedicated myself to. And um, my cousin was training at the time. He was my big cousin, so I kind of took role in what he was doing. And I used to have the car, so I'd drive him to training. And I just moved to London, so I didn't have a whole heap of friends, but he was a friend I had. So I was kind of birds of a feather flock together. So if he box, I'll probably box. If I want to go eat here, he'll come with me and eat here. So he mixed and match ideas and what we liked. And then I just sat back and I thought I could do this. But one thing I realised is that it's so easy watching from the outside, <laughs> you know, throw your jab and move out of the way of that punch. Boxing's about not getting hit. If it was that easy, everyone would do it. But um, I tried. And uh, one thing leads to another in a boxing gym. It's very old school. It's um, you come in once, next minute is Josh. Go and get your head guard, you're sparring and you're thinking, what sparring? I ain't even learned how to throw a jab yet. Next minute is, Josh, um, make sure you're running on Saturday, because in three weeks you're fighting here. And the issue is, is that you hear about stories about people that didn't reach their full potential because of that fear. 
you know, and you don't get that respect. So it's back to the mindset I used to have is that overcome the fear, but through that you gain a lot of respect. So I just kind of cracked on and I enjoyed the background of a lot of the people I work with in the gym, different races, different religions, different shapes and sizes, people from different backgrounds, welcomed everyone into the gym. So there was a real good bunch of friends I made from there. And I didn't want to lose that because of fear of competing at a different level. So I just cracked on. I saw the benefits when I was younger. I used to smoke, um, clubbing, you know, kebabs after the rave, <laughs> as you do. Yeah. As we you still do. do it. Exactly. Yeah. So you I never got off that bandwagon. <laughs> <laughs> you never got off the bandwagon. <laughs> so things like that, I started realizing and started flip reversing and changing. And then um, that's why I carried on going. I think the thing that I get from that then is that you, you weren't afraid to step out of your comfort zone. So mm -hmm. if we take you back to your childhood and, and growing up on that council estate, mm. what was it about that community? What was it about your upbringing do you feel that allowed you to be so natural in and out of a comfort okay. atmosphere? Yeah, so my parents were, um, grew up in Nigeria and then they came to England. So like, let's say I'm first generation in England. So I was born in England. And um, so on the estate, like, it's, it's, it's different cultures, isn't it? So my parents are from Nigeria, born there, so on and so forth, so forth raised there. And then I'm in England in a state, so it was different cultures, so it was stepping out of my comfort zone. So in my house, it's like I'm still in Nigeria, but then I leave the house and it's like I'm in England. So yeah. it's like different cultures, so it's about mixing with different people, mixing with different cultures. Um, the good thing about growing up on the estate is that there was about 40 of us, you know, kids. So it was not a problem. That's why I think I can mix with people easily because I wasn't sheltered. And the good thing about maybe sign boxing late is that if I did start when I was like 10, I think I wouldn't have seen or done half of the things I've done because I would have been sheltered away. Like, no, 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 don't ride a motorbike. No, don't go out there. Don't stay out past nine o'clock. I lived, I experienced, I've had fun. And it kind of shapes you, right? what you learn is who you become and, and I think those type of things shape me so that's the benefits of growing up I think on a council estate and having different experiences like with culture and um, having so many different friends with the same not issues but the same type of uh, things I went through and we all just mix them blend some people become your friends some people don't you, 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 you agree to disagree on some situations and um, this is what life's about isn't it you know keep on going and just uh, just keep cracking on. That is it. Keep, crap, uh, keep crap, cracking on. <laughs> Tongue twister. I still got friends that I that I grew up with as well that are doing well for themselves, and it's impressive. They really impressed me because there was like not a lack of opportunity, but um, you can become settled within that community. Just on that, we, we see in the film Rocky and yeah. Sly when he goes back to Philadelphia to his area. Yeah. He's saying hello to everyone. Yeah. Everyone roots for him. Mm -hmm. Everyone is a Rocky fan. Yeah. Is that the same? Are you seeing the same faces that you saw as a wee nipper and people are, are, are AJ fans? Do you know what? It's nice. A lot of the young kids, for sure, a lot of the young kids and parents, you know, the machine behind with the team that I work with, they're doing a great job to kind of tell the story where we came from. And I went back to the area to do some, to do some work and it's interesting because the same places we used to chill out are the younger faces that are now a lot older, you know? So that was nice to see the guys. And it's that thing is like, even though I haven't been here for 10 years, I still think I'm 18, you know? Like I can come and kick it with the kids. <laughs> but they still show that respect, which is nice. And that's the main thing. The respect is good. You can still go there. And um, I haven't lost touch with anything that used to go on. Or, or anything like that. I'm still in touch with the reality, the real side of what goes on in life. Even though we're out here enjoying... Um, the presidential suite. <laughs> sitting in a presidential suite. I could go back to my estate, no problem. I could stay there for five years if I needed to. Because I'm a lost touch with that side of life, if you know where I'm coming from. Which is good. And I think people respect that. And that's why the, the slogan I use, stay humble, doesn't mean like take a load of nonsense and sit back and hide in your corner. It just means treat the person on the street who hasn't got a home to live in with the same respect as a person who lives in a palace. It's an equal playing field. You treat everyone with the same respect. And that's where that Stay Humble came from, is that don't lose touch with reality, you know? We're going to name drop a little here because we were lucky enough to get an interview with Mike Tyson. On I am Mike. In May. 
And he favorite. said you have to be an interesting kind of person to be a fighter. And he looked back on his career and he almost thought, I, I don't know, I don't know what possessed me to get in a ring for all those yeah. times and put myself through that. What, what, what is it about fighting that, that is your release or, or you, that, that just you identify with? About fighting? Hmm. It's a pure form of combat. You know, it's a pure form. <sighs> there's no turning back. It's a road you go down that there's no turning back. For me, it's like you turn up to an event, the red carpet's rolled out, and you know when you get to the... So someone will prep you. You're gonna get here, don't talk to this press, make sure you talk to this. Walk down, photos on your left, signatures on your right, and there's the end, and then you're gonna go into your event. But with, with me and boxing, it feels like I was just chucked on the red carpet. I don't know what, what press to talk to, what not, what signature. I just walk down the red carpet and there's no turning back. And I'm just gonna make the most of this runway while I'm on it. And, and that's it, we're just having fun with it. So I've come too far to turn back, <laughs> you know. It was never planned. It does get tough. When I hear people being negative, it takes away from the pureness of the sport. I don't like that type of stuff. And that's why sometimes a little fire boils up inside of me <laughs> and they get a bit of bite back. But other than that, I'm not interested in all that stuff because I don't think that's the pure side of boxing. But I just think that there's no turning back once you get so deep into it. Because it is, it is tough. It is tough. Well, let's talk about some of that negativity. I say negativity. There's it is an negativity. awful lot of noise right now. Yeah. Which is quite nice in the heavyweight division. It's I needed. Think. It's needed, right? Yeah, it is needed. We we've seen. Joseph Parker, which I'm quoting here, one of the most cringe-worthy press conferences. Can we quote place. that again? One of the most <laughs> cringe-worthy press it's conferences unbelievable. that took place an hour or so ago, Anthony. Claimed he had footage of you, which I think yeah. has since transpired 17-year-old when you're still a young boy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of this noise, your reaction to that? <sighs> Deep breath. The, f the fight's still not made. You know where I'm coming from? The fight's still not made, so it's just like... It's a time thing. It's, he's investing his time in the wrong areas. Does he want publicity? Is it a PR stunt? I just put it like this. Like, it's not about worrying about who we fought or who we fight. Because I've worked my way through the ranks. From my 15th fight, I competed for the heavyweight championship of the world. 15 fights in, three years as a professional. And then I think in my 19th or 20th fight, we unified the heavyweight division fighting Vladimir Klitschko, which in hindsight, realistically, number one, I should have never fought for the heavyweight championship so early, but the opportunity came. And I should have never been fighting Vladimir Klitschko so early, but the opportunity came. So we managed to work with the champions many a times. I think I've defended it now four or five times with no complaints against one of the all-time greats. We came together, put on a great show. So what's so difficult with fighting this little kid doing press conferences, talking a load of rubbish. I don't get it. <laughs> like, we work with people, so it just, it's just very unprofessional of them, you know. Um, but it's a shame because boxing has so much credibility. The heavyweight championship is a really well-respected uh, title to have. But stuff like that takes away from, like, the creme de la creme of the sport, I think. Do, you, just... do you read? What, what's what's being said? Do you, do you keep an eye on? I think Deontay Wilder said uh, he's first of all he's named his belt Sophia. <laughs> wow. Uh, which I'm not sure. Uh, can you name a belt that you're not? I lonely? don't know. It's maybe you name some men name their cars. Uh, yeah. Some lonely men name their cars. <laughs> Just to clarify, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't have any girls' names for your two belts. I no, you. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I actually don't. <laughs> Maybe you should get on that, AJ. No, nah, I'm, not, I'm not joining that bandwagon. I'm not joining that bandwagon. But, um, but in yeah. terms of uh, you know, all the noise that's around at the moment, in your mind, is there a logical order to what should happen next year? Yeah, in the terms of, as like I said, I've worked with people who have achieved way more than me in the sport. And, we met, and I was like, so they achieved a lot. They weren't champion anymore. And we came together. We put our egos aside and we came together to create fights. So how next year should work is, realistically, I'm still on my journey. Like, no one can dictate to me what I should be doing. You know, these guys aren't dictators of my career. This is how I should plan up my career how I want. But I hear some of, let's say, people from the enemy lines chirping up, and we're not afraid to go to war. So we come together, and we sit down like men, and we try and draw an agreement. And if the agreement isn't 
good enough or they're not happy with what they are offered because remember it, they're the ones that are declaring war but telling me that they need to buy arms from me they should be locked and loaded and telling me this is what we have to offer but there's no offer from their side so what i feel like is that we'll go to them put an offer on the table they start demanding this 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 that's not real so it's like outbidding yourself and um we're back to square one so next year should be as simple as this if they're really interested in fighting we'll look at where they're competing where they want to compete in terms of what they're generating in terms of rematch clauses um who walks first who walks second uh profits and loss triple what they could be earning financially and then why wouldn't they take the opportunity to capture the heavyweight title? I don't understand. So it's as simple as that, I think. It's not, boxing isn't a complicated business when you're working with us especially. So I don't know why, as I said, we've worked with it's people. It's become one, hasn't it? Though? Yeah, but that's what I say. We've worked with people before who, who could have had a massive ego, but they put that aside and we managed to put on a great show. And now he, like Klitschko, retired on, on that loss because he was, he was happy with what he mm. achieved that night. So I don't see why these guys can't, follow suit and kind of um, realise that these guys aren't a headache to work with, we're good to work with, but they need to put their egos aside and stop doing silly stuff like that press conference because it doesn't really gain any credibility, I don't think. Of the three, Anthony, of the three, Parker, Fury and Wilder, who do you think possesses the, the game, the, the, the weapons that could trouble you the most? Fury. Fury. He's um, just awkward. He's just awkward if you know where I'm coming from. Tall. And I think he's a bit of a nut job to be honest with you. <laughs> 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 to be honest, I think he's just got a bit of a screw loose. So any man with that, even if it's in business, you know, just any man with a bit of a screw loose, I'm sure you worked with guys like that before. Um, they just have a little something that you can't put your finger on. So with you, it'll be tricky to figure him out. I think Wilder, I know what I have to do with Wilder. Parker, I don't disregard him, but I think, you know, I'll, I'll smack Parker around the ring. No problem. Wilder, I'll knock Wilder out. Take a bit of time, but I'll definitely knock him out. Parker will take a bit more of a pasting, but I'll get to him. Wilder, I'll knock him out with one shot. Not like I'll go in there and bang, but when I catch Wilder, I'll definitely knock him out. And Fury will be a real breakdown job, a real gruesome type fight. Kind of like that Klitschko fight. I'll, I'll go to Hellfire and back to get the win. And Did he impress you in that Klitschko fight, Fury? In, uh, in his evasive nah, skills, at least? Nah. Box 12 rounds and ran. Don't respect that. As I always said, like, if I'm the, if I'm the king of Dubai in the olden, in the olden days and um, a different empire comes to take my territory, you don't come and steal my treasure. That's what Fury done, I think. He stole, he stole the belts from Klitschko in a sense, like he just boxed the move. I know it's the art of boxing, but I always said that you come to slay the king. You look him in his face, you know, and you, and you take what's his. And that's what I think me and Klitschko, what me and Klitschko done, we came together man to man and just went to war. And I think that's like relit the division as well. Undoubtedly. Yeah. I so mean, easily the best fight I've seen in numerous years. For you, is there any boxing fight that stands out for you personally as being the best that you've ever witnessed? Uh, Ron Lyle, George Foreman, which is good. Um, Atora Gatti, Mickey Ward was good. Yes. Yeah. Um, All three. Yeah, I liked uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, Hagler. He boxed really well. I like Sugar Ray Leonard. There's many fights. Mm, uh, Evander Holyfield, Riddick Bo, mm -hmm. really good heavyweight clash. But yeah, Mike Tyson, I just like the way you used to knock people out. But like I said, with the, why I like the fact that Fury won, which was good, but if I had it anyway, I think if, a, if an up and coming king wants to take the new king's treasure, you look him in the face and you put the dagger in his chest. I don't think you stay from afar and slash 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 you go to war face on face and that's what me and Klitschko have done and then the new king's announced I think you've, de you've really dethroned the old king you knocked him out you took him out of his uh, 
you took him out of that throne and now you sit as a, and now you sit as a king and I think that's what being the heavyweight champion is the new king on the block because I think if you go to points you're only as good as the last champion you have to knock out the old champion and show that I'm stronger I'm more powerful I'm more fearsome I'm going to knock the old champion out so it shows that this guy is a a bit of a force to be reckoned with but if I went out there and boxed with Klitschko and went 12 rounds we're just as good as each other the judges, the judges made the decision on the fight. I went and took the belts from him. I knocked him out. I didn't leave it to no judges. We've got some questions, Anthony, on your own career, almost like a little quiz to finish on. Yeah. But uh, we're going to find out exactly how well you know your own career. I'm not that big-headed. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready for you know this? No, I know every answer. <laughs> It's good. It means you're not self-obsessed yeah, if you yeah. know the answer, right? <laughs> Great Britain, and I want to ask you about the Olympic gold because Luke Campbell um, said that that's the pinnacle of his achievement thus far. Now that you have become <clears> unified <throat> heavyweight champion, where yeah. does that Olympic gold rank for you? Does it sit alone, or, or where would you put it? It's, with all due respect, it sits alone in second place after the Wembley showdown with Klitschko, because when I started boxing as an amateur. It, it took me three years to go from walking in the gym with my cousin to then competing with the best in the world. So it was three years spin around and I, I just didn't even know what was going on. No one in my family was big on boxing or, or in sport in general. And then I was at the Olympics. So when I fought Klitschko, I think that was an eight year period that any amateur needs to hone his skills. So I think before any, before any amateur turns professional, I think they need eight years in the game of learning their craft, boxing at an amateur level, four years at their club level, maybe four years at an Olympic level. And I feel that me and Klitschko, that was my gold medal fight in Rio. So a lot of my friends, Joe Joyce, Boatsy, all of these guys, Lawrence Okoli, he went to Rio 2016. I think that's where I should have been and I would have been more experienced. I would have kn knew about what I was doing. I would have embraced it a bit more, but London was a bit of a blur because it was just so quick, it happened quick. But that time when we unified the division with Klitschko, I felt like that was my Rio Olympic gold medal fight. The question is, Great Britain won 29 medals at that 2012 Olympics. Do you know which number yours was? The 29th. It was? Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Number two, you are one of only two men to have won a world heavyweight title while still reigning as Olympic champion. Who's the other? One of, one of only two men. Yes. How many chances do I get? Should okay. we give multiple choice? Well, well, uh, you can take as many as you want, and we're not going <laughs> to argue with yeah, that. We're not starting a fight here, Anthony. Okay, let me think. <laughs> oh, God, who was it? Give you a wait, clue. Wait, wait, wait. Um, Joe Fraser. It was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, right. Yeah. And, and on that note, who, did, did you have a boxing, I mean, obviously you were late to the sport, but did you have a boxing hero when you were a kid? Mike Tyson. The main man, yeah, I am Mike. Was there more than one reigning Olympic champion? You and Joe Frazier? Me and Joe Frazier, yeah. It's a pretty cool stat. Well, you know, remember Legacy, the badge and all that. You You're going to know this one, AJ. <laughs> <laughs> Which venue has hosted the most of your professional fights? Uh, Wembley. Ooh. Oh, which venue has hosted Morgan. the most? O2. Yeah. Yes, O2. Yeah, the correct. O2, sorry. Seven, seven of 20. Seven, yeah. Against yeah. which fighter did you record your quickest knockout? Uh, Matt Legg. Yes. You're going you're gonna to smash this, AJ. <laughs> How do I know this? What, what's, your, what's your favourite knockout? Do you, have a, do you have a knockout you were like, that was sweet? Uh, <laughs> the one coming up. When you nah. left that guy lolling on the ropes, I can't remember. Zambano Love. Yeah, that's the I one. I remember yeah. it. <laughs> nah. <laughs> My favourite one, honestly, was uh, Michael Sprott. Yeah, okay. He went in the ropes, I've gone bang, 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 and I've just worked his body all the way up to the top of his head. I've just gone bang, 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 bang. And uh, it was just a good display of like switch, switch of attacks. They call it switch of attacks. To the body, switch to the head. And um, you just can't see where the punches are coming from. And that's why I like that knockout. This is one to finish off, to make it five out of five. You landed 107 punches in your fight against Vladimir Klitschko. Was that less or more than a certain Mr. Fury landed against the same? More. It was indeed more. Way more. 
five out of five. Tyson <laughs> we, Fury yeah. landed. He landed about five, didn't he? <laughs> 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 well, what actually landed out Well, it says here that he landed 86. Now, I'm conscious of time, AJ. I think it's a question that myself and Robbie discussed. We've yeah. been discussing it over the past 24 hours. Just having spoken to you for the past 40 minutes, just seeing that you're much more than just a fighter. You are a humble human being who wants to evoke change. Yeah. What will be success? What is what, what, success? What will be success? For you. Okay. I'm not psychic, but I know what works for me, as we all do. Sleep late, you wake up tired. You don't eat, you get hungry. So I know what works. So education for me is important. Um, and as I always said, is I have a platform to speak about different subjects and hear people's opinions. But the reason why I don't speak on them too much because I haven't educated myself because I've dedicated my life to sport. So I have to be self-educated. So what will be success for me is actually gaining a heap of knowledge reading the books I choose to read, taking time up for myself and, um, and touching on subjects that are relative to people's lifestyles. And as I said, I feel like I can't take on a government's job to support local people. Do you know where I'm coming from? Mm. But I can be a spokesman at some stage for these people and listen to the needs. And it's not, I'm not big into, I'm just gonna open up a gym and um, help change people's lives because there's a million ways of getting into sports, you know. You're in sports, you can be a presenter, you can do commentary, you we can be no a manager. <laughs> yeah, but there's different ways of getting into it, you know. It's not all about ability with these. So I wanna teach people about, there's enough sports stars, there's enough celebrities, there's enough actors, you know. So we need people who are educated, leaders. So that's what I'd like to do, is create more so leaders. And that's what boxing helped me do, is become more of a disciplined, mature man. Not just from a sports perspective, but as a man that takes care of my household, looks after my mum, looks after my father, takes on that role. Because before I was always out, hi mum, bye mum, no interest, you know what I mean? But now I take time, is everything all right? And that's what sports has given me. So I would help to create people to become leaders. And um, that way you look after your, your family and it, it echoes in like, uh, it's what you pass on to, to the kids and their kids, and it's a moral stand ground that I'll give to these people, and that's what I want. Last couple, AJ, you, you, you've been out here, you, you've, you've done you great live work out here now, right? Well, fitness yeah. challenge. Welcome to my suite, right? <laughs> this, D this Dubai is, my is uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Dub Dubai's clearly a special place for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you obviously, you got, a, you got behind an initiative that, that had the backing of the royal family. Talk to us about your, your, your stay out here and, and how much you've enjoyed it. Well, I came out here to work with the Dubai Fitness Challenge. Um, it, was, it was a really good a really good narrative. I hope people are still training. <laughs> but I think it gets the whole, the whole city moving. You know, I like Dubai as a whole, as a holiday destination. If you don't want to train, I completely understand. There's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of distractions. Um, it's a beautiful place and it has a lot of culture. That's one thing I hope Dubai never loses is culture as well, because that's important for people to come and see. Um, but the, the Dubai Fitness Challenge was really good. I got involved in that and it was interesting because like the people came out and I think they just came out to support of the city, of myself, and the workout I had completely got thrown out the window because I thought people were coming out with their mats, there was gonna be space for them to stretch and lean, but it was just jam packed. And I was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do here? They were playing music and it turned into like a concert. <laughs> we were just jumping and it was just really good. The spirits of the city are high and, you know, what they have going on here is 10 out of 10 and it's done. We closed the show and I'll definitely do it again if I was ever needed. In terms of the restaurants that are just in around this particular facility, I mean, yeah. I've been here an awful lot. Yeah. There's a lot of temptation, yeah, yeah, as yeah. you can see from my midriff. <laughs> I take advantage of that temptation. An Whenever there's lot. a free meal, this guy's there. <laughs> I am there, and I'm, yeah, I'm always loving a free meal. I'm Scottish <laughs> at the end of the day, AJ. But how do you balance that side of things, enjoying your food and enjoying the restaurants, the hospitality, as well as keeping in shape? I made a big mistake once when I came here. <laughs> <laughs> so I came here after I fought Eric Molina, who, was the fight before the Klitschko fight. And I came to Dubai, and at the minute I'm 113 ki kilograms, 112 kilograms. But the time when I came here last, and I was sitting back living like a king, I went back to training camp at 119 kilograms. And my coach looked at me and said, what <laughs> have you been doing with yourself? <laughs> and it was just taking in the food, you know, people here are real foodies, you can relax. Um, 
there's everything you need, you know. The service is 10 out of 10. It's everything you need away from home on a break. And I had that. And um, how I balance it now is having flashbacks to the torture I got when I went back to training camp because of my relaxation. Still about 50 kilos lighter than the <laughs> Yeah, can you imagine that? <laughs> I advise him not to come out here. <laughs> he needs to stay in the gym somewhere. <laughs> just, excuse me, just on that, yeah. you've come to have this place as a bit of a home away from home. Yeah. Incredibly relaxed. Could you ever get out of that mindset of Dubai being a relaxing destination and actually put on a show here? Put on oh, a boxing ring? A hundred and ten probably fit a hundred people around that ring up there. Could you Manning do something was supposed like to fight here. Jeff was he? Horn. Yeah, but it never happened. I was supposed to fight Jeff Horn. Apparently. That was talk of it. But yeah. There was talk of you coming as well. <laughs> the good thing, I think, Manny was, it's, it's, it's a shame because Manny was kind of at the end of his career mm. to a certain degree. We still got a lot of time, but I have to maintain and stay at the top of my game for this thing to, to work. And it's not just about fighting here. I think it's who I fight here because it's never been done. So it has to be a mega fight. Um, but for sure, I could definitely reverse the side of relaxing to a side of work. You can't beat working in, a, in an environment like this. If I can do it back home in the rain and the cold, I can <laughs> definitely do it here. You, you know, could I'm meet Parker from. in the middle because he's got to come all the way from New Zealand. You could just... Yeah, let's not talk about Parker for now. <laughs> well, listen, AJ, it's been an absolute yeah. thrill for us. It really has. We, we no, appreciate you. you sparing some time to talk yeah. to us this morning. No, thank you this morning. You are the champ. We expect that to be the case yes, for the next sir. few years. Mm -hmm. In terms of final one, do you have a retirement date? Do you have a year that you want to have everything achieved? We, we spoke about this from a point of view of um, how long do I want to get punched in the head, you know? It's not long. My coach will say, yeah, you only need four or five more fights. But on a business perspective and a legacy perspective, I've got to do it for 10 years. For the people, for, for my legacy, what we're trying to create, I have to be in this game for another 10 years. Yeah. And your mum supports that? I think she, she supports any decision now. She knows I'm mature, so she supports me. She knows I try not to make too many mistakes. I'm not perfect, as I said after the fight, but I'm trying. <laughs> AJ, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you Thank very you much. So much. Thank you so much, my man. Thank Cheers. you, bud. Excellent. Thank you so much. No problem.